Greetings, YouTube. When I was 10 or 11, I discovered a pen and ink uh, drawing that my godfather had on the wall in his uh, guest room. It had been done by a survivor of the death camps, and it depicted uh, the tortures that the inmates had suffered at the hands of the Nazis, that he had suffered at the hands of the Nazis. It was, without a doubt, the most depressing pen and ink drawing I have ever seen. It's haunted me for 35 years. For years after, I had nightmares about it. I may have another one today just because I'm talking about it right now with such intensity. But it's something that I never forgot, just how depressing that image was. Now I tell you this for a reason, so that you have some context when I tell you that this book right here, Savage Inequalities, Children in America's Schools by Jonathan Kozel, is hands down the most depressing book I have ever read. The author gathered information during the years 1988 to 1990 about American schools, specifically in East St. Louis, Chicago, and New York. And his plan as an educator was to compare and contrast urban schools, which were primarily um, black, Hispanic, and Asian, with suburban schools, which are primarily white, and compare the inequalities between these different institutions. Even though the differences between the two towns could be measured in minutes on a bridge or on a highway. You could literally walk from one of these communities to the other if you so chose. And yet there were vast differences between these two groups. In East St. Louis, the community was such that the sewer system backed into the streets on a regular basis. The schools had no equipment, no books, a library with 700 volumes. Um, the new one of the New York schools was a, an old roller skating rink that had classrooms with no windows, with 60 children crammed into a room that should have only had 30. Some of the schools had 87 square feet per student, as opposed to the suburban schools just a short ride away, which had 235 square feet per student. 87 square feet is roughly the size of a jail cell. Think about that for a minute. He talks about how the teachers are often undertrained or ill-suited to the job because they have tenure and the school systems turf them into the urban communities because they don't care if the urban students get an education. He talks about the fact that schools that had rats in their kitchens, had gymnasiums that you couldn't use for exercise because they'd been crammed full of classrooms, five and six classes going on all at once, of classes that had 35, some 40 students. One class he discussed had 45 students on, on opening day, and the principal told them, don't worry about it, by Christmas half of them will be gone. So the school systems were factoring in that half their students would drop out so that the teacher would then have a class size small enough to handle. They weren't concerned about keeping those students in class. They knew they couldn't. They knew they would disappear. Or a truancy officer who had a single person in charge of a, a region, and she was in charge of tracking down four hundred students every day. Does that maybe make you think that the school system really didn't care about these kids being truant? About the urban schools receiving half the money that suburban schools did. Now, I realize that some of the people that are watching this video don't live in the U.S., but the bulk of the money that goes to pay for schools in the United States comes from uh, property taxes 
which means that poor communities have less money to put into their schools than wealthy, affluent communities do. But even though that's the fact, poor communities often tax themselves at a higher rate so that more money will go into their schools, yet they still have less than the affluent communities because even at a higher tax rate, they simply cannot generate the funds because the property taxes are so much lower in the poor communities. Where affluent communities not only have a higher tax rate, but a, a, a higher amounts of money, but a lower tax rate, meaning that they then have more capital in their pockets. They can then use this as a discretionary amount if they want to donate money to their schools, which they frequently do, something that people living in a poor community cannot do. Now, for a long time, I thought that this method of paying for schools, the property tax, was an artifact of a past age, that maybe when it was originally conceived of, it was a good idea, they put it into play, and then it just kind of had a, a legacy of its own. You know, it has a, a momentum, as a bureaucracy can. And so no one changed because, you know, that's just the way we've always done it. But now I have a different opinion. Now I don't think it is necessarily momentum. I think it's by design. Now originally, the method that we chose, property taxes, may have just been what made sense at the time. But since then, it's become a tool used by those in power to make sure that they stay in power. That making sure that the poor communities have no funding, schools with holes in the wall and, the, and holes in their roofs, with nowhere for children to play, schools that have no playgrounds, no art programs, a music program that only takes care of 30 students out of a school of 680, a school that's designed to hold 700 students that has 1,300 in it. That this is done by design so that poor, uneducated communities remain poor and uneducated, while the wealthy, affluent, well-educated communities remain affluent and well-educated. Because you see, numerically, eventually, people like me, really white folks, are going to be in the minority. But this method of funding schools is going to ensure that the white folks are still in charge. Because their school systems are going to be affluent and well-funded and providing their children with good educations. They are going to be the governors of society, whereas the children that grow up in the poor, uneducated communities will be the governed. This may won't last forever, but it will eke out a few more generations of the affluent, well-educated people being in charge. And yes, it sickens me. It makes me s nauseous just thinking about this. I'm kind of sad I ate breakfast before I did this video, because at the moment, my stomach is literally turning. Because no one here in America wants to deal with the fact that our children are not treated equally. That there is no equity. You want to fix this problem? And take all the money collected in all the states of the Union, all 50. You put it into a big pool. And then you divide it evenly by the number of students enrolled that year. So that every single student gets exactly the same amount of money. And yes, I am discussing the redistribution of wealth. Because life is unfair enough. We should at least make sure that our children start out on a level playing field, when in our world right now, there aren't even playing fields at all for some of our children. I'd also make sure that every single child has a Head Start program, which is a preschool program. I would make sure that every single child has access to a kindergarten program, mandatory, and that they would have a fully funded curriculum art, music, science labs that actually have equipment, textbooks for every student, 
AP courses, advanced placement courses, for every student that qualifies. Teachers that are trained properly for the grade they are teaching, and I would eliminate tenure. I want people held to standards of excellence, not just because you survived long enough to get tenure and now we can't get rid of you. I know, I'm discussing radical things here, evil socialist things. Actually treating people fairly and equitably in America is not going to be viewed well by the conservatives. I can hear the Tea Party members railing against the dying of the light as I speak. But our children all look at the same flag every day. Most of them say a pledge to it. One nation indivisible. Except it is divisible into poor, uneducated communities and affluent, well-educated communities. And we need that to end. Every single student needs to be treated equally under the law, given the same opportunity so that everyone has the chance, through merit and hard work, of being the governors. Not just because you got lucky and were born white and into a nice suburb. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate comments for this, because these are radical socialist concepts. But I'm sick at the moment. I'm disgusted at America. Because the things that happened in this book that he discussed shouldn't have happened anywhere in a first world nation. They shouldn't have happened in a third world nation. But not in America. Not after generations of people fighting and dying for their equal rights. And yet there it was. They're right there in black and white. It hurt to turn every page because I knew I was going to read something else that was just going to make me nauseous. But I did, all the way to the end. And I'm glad I did. It's an excellent book. But it is, without a doubt, the most depressing thing I have ever read. <laughs>